again. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Uh, I think you are going to enjoy the show. Uh, I've been... Uh, I've, hello? Hello. Let's just get this far away. It's fine. Um, I've been asked to do um, a little introduction. Um, and though I just met Franci Francisca and Marlon tonight, um, I've discovered that they're very interesting people. <laughs> so um, I think that you will enjoy this. Uh, Marlon has multiple degrees from KU and NYU. Um, he's done poetry and short fiction and novel and uh, you do some editing and things, don't you, as well. Um, a number of fellowships, including um, the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, he, um, the, the book that he's gonna, um, that they're gonna present to you tonight was just nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award. Hopes to find out some excellent news in January. Uh, Francisca Esteve, um, born in Valencia, yes, and then moved to Barcelona. I almost said Boston. That's very different. <laughs> Barcelona. Um, uh, it, she joined the anti-fascist fascist, uh, resistance, resistance movement. Let me Back up. She joined the anti-fascist resistance movement um, that helped to, um, I feel like, probably bring you some of the stuff that you're going to hear tonight. Um, so uh, she's also a trained painter. Of course she is. That's awesome. Uh, so um, I think uh, without any further ado from me, I'd like to introduce you, uh, Marlon Fick and Francesca Esteve. literally say hello to old friends and family. My cousin John is here. We have the same last name. Uh, we share the same DNA. My, my pal Joel is here. A former student, Amanda, is here. A wife of another student, Dustin Stovall. Christian Stovall is here. Uh, Dennis and Carol Kuhlman are here. And the Salina Journal, Jason <laughs> Beats is here. That's really awesome. So, you know, this is kind of what it was felt like to be at McNally's a couple of weeks ago in Soho in New York. Um, so we looked out at the crowd, and there's all these illustrious people, uh, Broadway directors and translators and novelists, and uh, that was really scary. This is scary <laughs> in another whole other different plane. Uh, we thought we'd talk to you a little bit about how this project began, a little bit of history, um, just to refresh our memories from you know, what we should have been listening to in class back in high school. There, used, there was a big, big civil war in Spain. Right? And uh, that happened in 1936, just before my wife was born. No, no. Okay, she was still, she was already with us. <laughs> Uh, her father, they were all living in Barcelona, and they were all Barcelonans, and her father had gone on a business trip to Madrid, really bad timing, and he was caught behind the, what became the lines and grabbed by Franco's army, and having three brothers um, in the pro-democracy forces, and at that same year, he spent the entire year in his Franco uniform, shooting in the air because he was afraid he'd hit his brother. Right. So very similar to the American past. Uh, my great-great-grandfather was afraid of the same thing. His, his brother, Alexander, was grabbed by the Confederacy. So that's a kind of, that kind of situation. That war was practice for the Nazis and their Luftwaffe, which bombed the heck out of her city, and you can see that devastation even today, some parts of the city. So he didn't know until 1939 when he was released and allowed to come home that all three of his brothers were killed the first week. Uh, one youngest brother escaped into France and joined the Foreign Legion. 
he lived sometime after that. During the occupation of the fascists in Spain, you were not allowed to speak your own language. And one of the things that comes with fascism is, um, well, let's call it alternative facts. <laughs> and one alternative fact at the time uh, with the propaganda is that uh, Catalan, these are just dialects of Spanish, and the Gallegos speak Gallego, that's a dialect, and the Catalan's a dialect, and um, Vasco, that's something else, Basque. But in fact, it's its own language. Um, but it, this is a Romance language, and let's see, what are some of the other Romance languages that you can think of? French, Italian, Romanian. Romanian. Romanian, that's right. Not, not many know that. That's it's the closest living relative to Latin. Portuguese. Portuguese. Um, and Catalan. The 9 to 11 million people speaking that language is not from Spanish, it's from Latin. Hmm. Um, it resembles, it's from Provencal, who, from which in English we get many of our forms, uh, like the Villanelle, the Sistina, they all came, and, and it it pushed forward the Italian form, the Petrarchan sonnet. So a lot of the poems that are in this anthology uh, are, are in Catalan. They're in Petrarchan form, form in Petrarchan, even though it's an Italian form. But we need to remember that the culture and the language have been around almost a thousand years. Uh, so in the 14th and 15th century, there was an they had their own empire. So Catalan is spoken all the way from uh, the north. And, Catalonia, down through Valencia, the Balearic Islands, with Menorca, Majorca, and even in, even Sicily and part of Spain, part of it to Italy. So it picked up some Italian, and during the Habsburg dynasty, it, it, which uh, is 17th century, it picks up some German as well. But it's still a Romance language. And you'll hear, if you've heard Spanish, you can, uh, otherwise, I, we live in Texas now, and, and half the town speaks Spanish, so um, you'll, uh, you'll hear that uh, Catalan sounds very different from Spanish. Like I say, I was speaking Spanish, this, this is kind of related, there's a little side topic, but just a few weeks ago, I was in the grocery store, and I said to the clerk, uh, Oye, ¿cómo estás? Uh, uh, ¿de, dónde, ¿De dónde eres originalmente? I said something to her in Spanish, I forget what. It's not important. But a lady in front of us turned to me and to her and very angrily said, You belong in my president's cages. Which, which are not very far from where we live now. Where, they're, you know, where the children are evidently not even enough room to, for everyone to lie down. And, it, and why is that similar? Because when my wife was growing up, it was the same way in, 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 in Barcelona. You would, they'd shake your, their, the police would shake their finger and say, speak Christian, meaning Castilian Spanish, speak Christian. To have a sense of how it sounds, in Spanish we would say, to, for the, to, to say, in the middle of the night, we would say, in el hondo de la noche. In French, we say, au fond de la nuit. In Catalan, we would say, au fond de la nuit. Au fond de la nuit. To hear a little, just a little bit from the introduction, because this is not bilingual, but in the introduction, we, we put one of the poems in the original. Al fons de la nit està glaçant l'aire, ha callat fins i tot el rossinyol. Amb el front recolzat damunt del vidre, demano que em perdonin les meves dues filles mortes, perquè ja gairebé no penso en elles. El temps ha anat deixant argila seca damunt la cicatriu, i fins i tot, quan s'estima algú, arriba l'oblit. La llum té la duresa de les gotes que cauen del xiprés amb el desgel. Poso un tronc nou i, removent les cendres, trec flama de les brases. Faig cafè. 
La vostra mare surt del dormitori amb un somriure. Quina bona olor, que has aixecat molt d'hora aquests matins. To leave you hanging, we'll, we'll tell you what she just said. Mm -hmm. The poem is by Juan Marguerite, who is a virtual rock star. So we're, we're sitting in a cafe. Uh, in order to translate poets who are alive, you have to earn their trust and their permission. So <laughs> people would go by and say, Is it Paul McCartney? We're walking down the street. And I'd say, Holy cow, that's Juan Marguerite. <laughs> in the middle of the night, the air is freezing so cold the, night and bird won't, the nightingale won't sing. With my forehead pressed against the window, I ask my two dead daughters for forgiveness because I rarely think about them anymore. Time has left dry clay or the scars. And besides, when one loves someone, forgetfulness follows. Light has the same hardness as drops that fall from frozen cypress trees. I place a log, stir the ashes, and the flames flare up from the coals. As I'm starting the coffee, your mother from the bedroom smiling says, what a wonderful smell. You have risen so early this morning. Uh, after the Civil War was over uh, and the resistance began, um, maybe a million or over a million, nobody really knows. Uh, people died or disappeared, uh, were sent to places like Monjuic, Ethel, the castle on the hill that uh, Joanne Marguerite calls the guilt of the city. Anywhere you go in Barcelona, you can see the castle where uh, the president was uh, executed and millions of people were put there and left to just starve to death. So while we're on the subject of Marguerite, this little one. Ballad of Monjuic. I arrived before dawn to be there alone. Oh, I'm sorry. Stop this. I'm going to limit this reading part to just 25 minutes um, because uh, something that uh, a Roman once said, a Roman fellow named Horace said that the very definition of a hell is to be stuck in the room with a poet. <laughs> So by limiting it to 20 to 25 minutes, that way we can just have a conversation. <laughs> I arrived before dawn to be there alone. The gas tank lights are still on and lights on the cranes in the port. The sea faces the misty city. Everything is the same. I think it's not worth coming, but the truth is I come anyway liking to walk the ramparts to see the ravines and quarries, the promontory with its gangrenous cemetery alongside. It doesn't want to be a park with statues from another time. It still guards its former lighthouses, executions, barracks. All the signs are precise, paved on the memory of the walls and etched on cypress trunks. When passion excites me to feel that I have lost some memory, Always the Manjuic inside me startles me to recognize my shadows. Vanquished loves like the remains of the guard tower and years from my life like bronze cannons to melt the monuments of sinister generals. Forgetfulness echoes like the death blows of the bodies of brute animals when they fall into their mass graves. I hide memories in the pit that guards under a bed of roses and tulips the footsteps of victims and their assassins inside me. They are, there are old trees and green that surrounds the fountains and kiosks, folk dances. Inside me, there is still festival music from the country, the dark and clandestine hotels, eyes of the anarchists, the city's hatred for military walls. I arrived before dawn to be there alone. Cascades without water look at me like eyes running with mascara after a hangover. Full of garbage quarries are strata deeper than luminous fountains. The amusement park where the Ferris wheel turns like melancholy. This is the past. There are lost days and I begin to love now that it's destroyed that time as it was, which then I didn't respect. 
And I love this memory that resonates in the wind between the steel cables and the white sails unfurled over the stadium. Manjuik is the gilt in the middle of the city. I rest my hand on the bronze cannon while a silent mountain rises inside me that bruises the story, buries the story for everyone. I have arrived before dawn to be there alone. Only a cold cannon where I caress it is truly an indifferent wolf. About, I guess it was about a year ago, a year and a half ago, America lost, well, we lost our entire generation of 1927 in one year. It's like, and one of those poets we lost was Philip Levine. Now, Philip Levine would travel to Barcelona every year, uh, go directly to a flower shop to buy roses, and he would then lay them at Monjuvi at the puts at the gate at Monjuic. Um, when we arrived at Monjuic, tourists were taking selfies. And I, it's just, it's, I just, I, I really, I really got upset by that. And I, and I asked a tourist, I said, "Hablas español? No, English? Oh, okay. Would you take a selfie at Auschwitz? Really? Would you do that?" Finding the women among the, the great poets in, uh, in that part of Spain was harder. Uh, not only were they silenced along with everyone else, they were women. So their horizon was the kitchen table. And for many years they were uh, so doubly silenced, if you like. Uh, for this book, uh, we, 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 we went... Um, we had to dig deeper to find them, but they were there, and still, and they still are. This is from Rosa Fons. Rosa is living in Girona right now, in the north of Spain. So I think she's from the Balearic Islands. I think she's from Mallorca. Rosa. Well, she's born in Mallorca. This is called all the seas. To be one field means to be all fields, with flowers and wheat or apple trees and pomegranates by the road. To be a sea means being all seas, the essence of blue and serene inlets, and to navigate forever without a course. To be a branch is to be all branches, birch and ash and willow and cypress, to draw new paths in unexplored skies. One book is all books light of the cosmos, letters of thousands of existing alphabets lost or not yet come to be. One voice is the voice of all those who do not speak, the voice of the forgotten, the voiceless is, is yours and mine. One living being is all living beings. The eyes of one are all eyes, the hands, all hands. We live in each voice, and die in each body. The eldest poet in the book uh, would have turned 90 yesterday. Uh, he was a sweet man, uh, a genius, but sweet also. His name is Marius Samper. And Marius, uh, well, we're, he couldn't come out of his apartment. We had to go to his apartment to meet him. And he leaned over to me, and in Catalan, he said, Regarding this project, he said, you better get it done fast. Um, he passed away in May. Uh, so, but it, so the book is dedicated to him. He, he, the thing that's characteristic of Sam Paris poetry is he always has a surprise. You never know what he's going to do uh, or what he's going to write about. And I let Francisca choose all the poems. And if I, if I like them too, then we, then we translate it. Of course, we translate a hundred times more poetry than, we, than what you see in the book. But the reason for that is that Francisca is a trained uh, painter at the, the Academy of Arts in Barcelona. 
but she's also not a literary person. The idea was by having Francisca make the initial choices, we could get a bit broader audience. Because I have worked in the field of literature for over, 30, over three decades, which makes me a little jaded. I mean, I'm not easily pleased. So, so one day when, for me, most poets are bad poets. <laughs> Uh, so when, but one day, you know, her office door swings open. She comes out with the book of Saint-Père in Catalan. I think, Saint-Père's written a poem about stoplights. <laughs> uh, we, have to, we have to translate this one. So, but this is Saint-Père writing about writing. He's always a little tongue-in-cheek. One day I was writing about how to write poetry, which really consisted in asking each name what other name it would be. Your name is longing for someone. You wouldn't want your name to be a premonition or a worm, would you? The rain is your name, so would you be named a tear? All that was a long time ago, and the names never answered. It must be that they were thinking about it. Now it's different. I wouldn't write that. I know that nothing, not even permanent envy from others, and resist this essential effort. That's just the way it is. There's no answer. It's pure indecision, just hesitation. And many years have passed, and every name is the dying ember beside its first invariable meaning. I think after so long, poetry makes the lips of the earth mute with just an adequate word. Pons Pons, that's P-O-N-C, P-O-N-S, Pons Pons, Pons Pons, Pons Pons is a lover of American literature. Um, and his favorite American writer is Henry David Thoreau. So in his, in his backyard, which faces the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, he actually built a perfect replica of the cabin at Walden Pond that Henry David Thoreau built, right down to the nail. <laughs> and that's where he does his writing. <laughs> he has a huge scope. He has an enormous scope of themes and topics. So you can't get rid of that. I want to show you two sides of him. One side is this kind of tender, uh, the teddy bear type that we know. This is a Christmas, and this is seasonal, Christmas letter to my father. I was never a hunter. I like to visit Viniguarda with you to see the dogs run or the partridges sing. When we came back to Lowe, we walked and listened to church bells. The world was joyful, safe, because you held my hand along the way. At home with my mother, watching her cook, we found my brothers, and there was great joy in so many of us. We all had dinner and listened to the radio. Saturday evening, I took a bath in the wash tub, and later you held me in the rocking chair. With the humble faith of the poor, you told me, Ponset, one day you will be rich. We will have land in Havana. But to me, that wasn't important because I had you. At home, you filled me with kindness with your blue eyes. I was the baby of the family, the one who listened the most to your stories about witches and dragons, or your fear-filled chatter about the Civil War. Many evenings you returned exhausted from the factory and spent extra time on your feet cutting pieces of leather up in your bedroom till late. I read voraciously all of the old books about the famous uncle from your side of the family, the one who was the confessor for two popes and other ecclesiastics in Rome. I see you always satisfied. You were wearing an apron, and you had a pencil in your ear. I often went to see you at uh, to, to Rivo Dios, and you would kiss me happy, and your mustache was scratchy. When your salary was so meager, it dissolved in a can, but you hugged my mother, and with a lively gesture, you smiled at her. Maria, everything will be clarified. And she clarified everything, and we grew up happy. 
you made us menorquinos with facts for examples. You told us that we have to be good people. Don't be lost in the woods. When you hear the bells as it gets dark and you come back alone on the paths of the dead, I will give you my hand and I will come to your side to hear your stories and hear you talk to me without fear of the Civil War. I hope you are fine and there are newspapers in heaven and you can hunt any time. You didn't care so much about politics. If you see God, tell him he didn't clarify anything, <laughs> that between war and hunger, he left a frightening world. Christmas is a sad time for me, and it's as if the nativity scenes were missing the old joy. Their little stars are dim, and the figurines of shepherds are not smiling. Always there is a worm in me that gnaws and it hurts. Since you've been gone, I felt the weight of a terrible emptiness. I don't want you to die, Father, anymore. Now, like, like most of these poets, um, history has left a bad taste in our mouth, particularly with regard to a religion. We were following a group of tourists, casually by accident, some American tourists, and, and the, this American student turned to the guide and said, gee, you have so many cathedrals, there are like four major cathedrals in Barcelona. You have so many, you, 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 you all must be so religious. The, the guide said, yeah, not so much. <laughs> and, and there's a reason for that. They, they, uh, Pope Pius XII actually got in bed with, well, not, well, maybe literally, <laughs> uh, but figuratively got in bed with the, uh, the fascists, with Franco. And so that really, um, that drove a lot of people away from religion. And so when Pons Pons takes, decides to rewrite the Bible and, and do his Bible stories, he gives them a bit of a sarcastic, maybe a little ironic, twist, and I know that irony doesn't go well in Kansas. I, mean, I, mean, I live in West Texas, so I have to watch what I say. But I try, um, I try not to, uh, but this is not that sarcastic. He's just retelling the story of Jacob. This is part seven out of like part 30, I don't know, um, where Joseph uh, is with the Pharaoh. Right? So he's, one day this thing I do will be important. The people will know why they are suffering, and maybe someone will get a job doing this. For now, they have given me an ebony divan where he lies down, and I let him talk. He tells me he's, his bewildering, muddled problems, and he tells me sleepily all his dreams. He doesn't know he wants to kill his father, or that he has a head full of tangles and phallic symbols. So if, you're, if you don't have a, a, a degree in psychology, as my colleague Joel, um, he's basically taking on the role of Sigmund Freud for the Pharaoh. So my mother read that yesterday, and she said, that's not funny. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny to me, you know. <laughs> but I'm on the sort of the other end of the... Christian perspective, and we found we actually found a church that would actually have us in West Texas. Mm. You know, so but sorry about that. Similar time. And which page? Uh, that was on page seventy-three. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to stay true to that twenty-five-minute promise. So I'm going to skip a, a, poem, a poet by Jordi Bidiyanga. We just met a couple of weeks ago in Austin at the International Writers Festival. Uh, he writes a really beautiful poem that I love. It's called A Tiny God. Uh, and you know what? The, what the hell? I'm going to read them both. I'm going to, it's on page 124. Uh, he always quotes Ausius Marsh, who's an important Catalan poet. Ramon Yul, very important. 13th century, you know, to have a great language, you have to have uh, 
couple of things. You have to have a city, an urban environment uh, where culture can, where lots of people can come together for dialoguing, for talking. And secondly, you have to have a master, a great master. So for Russia, what was that? It was Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. For English, it was who? Mark Shakespeare. Twain. Shakespeare, yes. Mark Twain in America is very important. Uh, Shakespeare to get the language really off the ground, right? Uh, in Spain, in Spanish, who was it? Cervantes. You say that with a theta. Cervantes. So when I went to Mexico and I asked for cerveza, they looked at me like, what? Is it cerveza? No, cerveza. You sound like a <laughs> Spanish mom. But in Catalan, the poet is Ramon Yul. It's L-L-U-L-L. Yul. A tiny god, you think that you are strong, that without you there would be no children and no parties there would be nothing without the man who, lists, who lights the fire in the garden. You know that your anniversary doesn't start without you, that we are civilized, that children don't have to suffer for what their parents do. I bring wine to the table and conger and sardines so you can go on roasting a heap of quartered animals. In the end, who will gather the eyes that gaze at the skirts? Who will keep Leonard Cohen company after the last person has gone? The lights without ears, with unfulfilled desires. They're dirty, the dishes dirty with mouth stains and you drunk, satisfied, throwing up while I gather once more the crumbs in the garden and the altar where the offerings have been burned or the tiny God who, li who lies between cardboard boxes. Manuel Furcano, this is the last little tiny one-page poem that I'm going to read so that we can talk. It's page 96. It's called Hydra. This poet is intensely passionate, and he would want me, I know that he would want me to, he told me to, uh, to let you know that these, these are, we can see the great. To this day, we don't know if Shakespeare was writing this love poetry for a, a lady or for a man. Um, we know with the case of Orfacano, this is for his husband. Once you had the name of one love on your lips, like the name of a boat on a bow with big letters, like an island printed over the blue on a map of the Aegean. What an island so small for a love so vast. What a love so vast for so few dead days. What few days for a memory so vast. What a memory so vast for a poem so small. One of the reasons I love that poem so much is because it's straight out of traditional Provencal form. It's, it's a form that exists in English in the poetry of Sir Philip Sidney. Uh, but it was introduced into English by Geoffrey Chaucer in 1300. So um, I, I'm really excited to know sh stupid little shit like that. <laughs> but it's not stupid to me, because I have to teach that to graduate students. <laughs> and that's what I'll be teaching next semester, so history of poetics uh, from Sappho to now. So uh, you, I hope that you have questions. The title means wheat. It's a special kind of wheat that grows in uh, goes all over Valencia. I saw it and I said, this looks like my, my home. I grew up east of Salina. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up there. I, 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 grew, I was born in Olathe, but I, you know, I grew up as a kid, always in the home place. Sometimes uh, it, I remember even playing with uh, my cousin John and his younger brother on their place. Um, but I feel like this was home because I spent so much time here working on the, on, on the farm with my uncle and my grandfather. And I, get, I think that uh, Dr. Kuhlman may have been crop dusting at that time. It was, he, he was the one dropping clouds of, of BET on top of us as we were out in the fields. <coughs> um, 
we get asked questions a lot about our process. Like, uh, for example, how can you work with uh, your ferocious Catalan Mediterranean uh, angry wife and still be married? <laughs> People want to know that a lot. What would you like to know? Yes. Uh, well, the target language is also is rich, but to, but to, to be really straight with you, um, there's always stuff that's lost, um, and so we, we sort of start with that part of the question. Uh, what's the line? He says, I have a French accent when I try to speak Catalan. <laughs> She just used the word the veu, veu, which in French is voir, is to see, but in, in Catalan it's see, it's also speak. But he's doing a, a, what's called a chiasmus. Okay? Chiasmus means the crossing. So it, there's a famous example when JFK says, Ask not what your uh, country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. But well, we can't translate that if he's using the same word. It would sound like, ask not what you can do for your country, but what you could do for your country. So, so in that case, what we do is we, we provide you with footnotes. Um, I think the answer to that, when, when they ask Ezra Pound the same question in Paris, uh, his answer was, in fullness, is said that tone poet. Right, does anyone know French? Il faut nécessaire d'être un poète. You, you have to be a, a poet. You have to be a poet to translate poetry. And and um, well, I'm a fledgling poet, <laughs> and so um, I'm brazen enough to try. Uh, but really, uh, more than half the credit in this case goes to Paki for explaining some of those nuances that would have been lost on me, cultural nuances. Because we have native Catalan, and we have a dedicated poet who are really sharing the responsibility of transmitting cultural information. But there are some things that you just can't translate. And uh, the idea of, like, the, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, well, the, the, the words in Catalan for for women who are sexually repressed is that they've had their anus so shut. But if you say, if you translate that, no one's going to know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> and so, so um, it just, it gets, it, I change it. I, you have to be free. And, and you just have to make a sound. And you decide whether it's good or not. You decide if you've just you, you decide if you've heard a poem that sounds like a translation or if it sounds seamless yeah. in the target language. Oh. In, 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 in translation, we also talk about gain. We don't just talk about loss. Uh, if 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 the poem has created a new and beautiful version in, in in the target language, then you have a new poem. The old language, uh, obviously, is is best, but we can't. All, we need translators. We can't. We can't all know a million languages. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a like a current question in translation studies. Um, and most most people say you should only translate from. Uh, into your native language, because your ear is good. Uh, I, I, I disagree. I think it depends on who the translator is. I have, for example, a really, really wonderful ear in Spanish now. Not when I did, not when I was first translating Spanish, but now, now I translate English to Spanish. And um, I have a lot of confidence. So, and, you know, if you think about it, uh, there, there are exceptions to the, the rule of always translating to your native language. 
uh, Samuel Beckett wrote directly in French and then translated them back into English as a, a playwright. Uh, and they have these uh, polyglots and polymaths like Joseph Conrad who's, or, or Nabokov who are writing in a, their, not their native language. I don't know if it was their second and third language, but they're writing in English. Uh, so, uh, but I think, I think it's rare. I think in the main, for most people, it's probably better to translate into your native language. There's no way I could, I just translated uh, for Tamsin Press, a Chinese poet. Um, I can never write in Chinese at all. That's, that's too far from my, my, my experiential background and my knowledge of poetry. Couldn't do it, but I can do it. I think, if, I think I can do Chinese in some justice in English. I, I knew a lot more Chinese than Ezra Pound did. Mm -hmm. Ezra Pound only had the Fenelos of manuscripts. Uh, he was basically looking at someone else's notes and creating something. And I have respect for Pound, but my Chinese is better. <laughs> so you walked us through uh, some of the early 20th century history of Catalan. Uh, and I was curious if you could walk us through the post-World War II history up and through the, the current uh, political climate. OK, so the 1938 Constitution, um, is a touchstone, but let's skip that remark and, and go to the 1978 Constitution of, of the Spanish, Spanish Constitution. Uh, there's a really vaguely worded clause. It's Article 144. Right? Okay. She says it is true. <laughs> yeah. Well, they say it's vaguely worded, but, but uh, and I've looked at it. It just looks, it just says, Essentially, that uh, the same kind of thing that we did with the Indian reservations here. So yeah, you're you're completely, totally autonomous. You Navajos can go. You can have your own police. You can have your own government. But uh, oh yeah, the FBI is going to come and go as they please. So um, it's really not total autonomy. It's more like semi-autonomy. So when Pujamon decided to have a referendum which is, by the way, more like having an opinion poll. It's not a strict vote. It was not a binding vote. It was a, a referendum. And this was in 2017. Uh, Madrid sent their police. And uh, they, they literally you can go on YouTube and see the incredible violence they committed against old people and kids and people that had lined up to vote at the referendum. Um, on a personal level, we have friends and family on both sides of that political argument. Just like you may have, you know, your Trump relative or your Obama relative and you can't stand them, right? You don't want to talk about that. So so we told the publisher we really don't want to get into that, but he said, no, you have to. This is auspicious timing. And he was right. I mean you can't publish anything in Catalan and it's already I mean this is already political. It's a political act just to publish in Catalan. Uh, but it's um, as soon as Franco died, the schools all went back to teaching in Catalan. Uh, she, she, her Catalan is perfect, but she learned it at home, so it's only perfect by accident. Uh, her mother and father, and you know, when they were home, it was safe to speak in Catalan, but not in the street. So her activities in the underground amounted to keeping the cultural life smuggling. She didn't set up bombs. They did actually lie at that time. The resistance movement did ally with with ETA, the uh, the Basque, and they set up bombs. But her role was uh, disseminating literature, grammar books, and 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 mimeographed copies of poems, and and spreading the language, and again, is, is to keep it alive during the Franco years. And it's only been suppressed twice in the past 900 years. The other time was during, uh, okay, yeah, right after the Habsburg dynasty collapsed in the early 18th century, it, there was a, a Bourbon king who outlawed, I don't, I wanna say 13 years, the 13 year period in which you, people were not allowed to speak Catalan at that time, so. Uh, 
uh, so as soon as Franco was gone, they, they quickly reverted back to the natural way. We speak Catalan, we don't speak Spanish, and if you go to Barcelona, all the signs are in Catalan. If you're a tourist, uh, they'll speak to you in Spanish. Now, some of the younger people will even speak to, uh, to you in English. Francisco grew up studying, uh, most common language to study was French, after Spanish, and after Catalan Spanish was, was French, because they're only a few, mi a few miles from the border. Um, there's an element to your question I'm probably not covering. So, I guess, I mean, prospectively, what, what do you think is going to end up happening with Catalan? Do you think that their independence bid will be successful? Do you think it'll just be a perpetual stalemate, kind of like Brexit, it'll just go on forever? Or No, I think that uh, the Catalonian position is weaker than, than England's. Um, they are, and that's not not practical, and we, we too asked that same question over and over, and we got the same answer from at least the intellectuals. We didn't talk to the man on the street, but the intellectuals say that it'll never happen. That they're too interwoven and too, and the, with the euro. Ever since they went off to Peseta, they went to the euro, and they're, they're, they're too much a part of the European Union to really exit from Spain. Exiting from Spain would involve renegotiating the European Union. So uh, the, most people think it won't happen. Okay. Yeah, but thank you for that question. Um, she should do more talking. Um, she She's kind of started out as a nationalist for, for Catalonia. And her home in Mexico City has a beautiful Catalan independence flag with a blue star, with a, with a star in the middle, you know, with, uh, seeing the independence flag. And then she's softened over, over time, um, partly, partly because of me. I mean, I'm always telling her that, oh, uh, yeah, you Catalans and you Texans <laughs> always wanted to succeed. Uh, you know, the Texans and the Catalans have something in common in that they were for, you know, well, Texas was his country. And when they came into the Union, they negotiated with the, with the uh, United States to run their flag at the same height. I was astounded. We got to Texas and they said, holy cow, are they allowed to do that? <laughs> to be the U.S. and then Texas. Mm -hmm. so, I think the working man who's really idealistic. I mean, a lot of it has to do with taxation, right? Uh, and so, if you're in the, the northern part of Spain, you're in a very rich, lush area that's, that's high yield, high producing area, and they're carrying the rest of Spain. But, but it's the same is true here. The same is true of, of states like California and New York, where taxes are much higher. Most of those tax dollars are gonna go to the poorest states like Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, it, I don't quite get why the red states, because they're getting most of the federal dollars. A lot goes to Texas, too, uh, because of the poverty there. Except that they're off, they offset the poverty with, uh, with the oil wealth. Uh, so. But there are a lot of correspondences, but we don't belong to the European Union, so... I don't know what's in our future, but I know that in Spain, I don't think any time soon. Do you disagree that any time soon, uh, Catalonia could be independent? Um, my heart says mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say no. Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. This question is for both of you. Um, since you're both dealing in cultures of difference, you know, we're different cultures, what was most uh, surprising to you each about the different cultures uh, as you were translating and working on their work? She's, she's shocked daily, <laughs> right? Because that's so am I. If you have Netflix, you can watch a, a, TV, a Netflix show. It's like a day in the life of living with her. Now, it's called Bienvenue a la Familia, or Bienvenidos a la Familia, Welcome to the Family. And you see this, wow. For, for example, uh, it's really normal for them to 
all talk at the same time and throw their arms around and, sorry, <laughs> to throw their arms around and, but I came from a, a Puritan descent, we just very reserved. So uh, she'll see, like she met one of my cousins today um, and she said, wow, she's really icy. I said, no, no, she's not. She's very <laughs> kind. She just, she's just, um, she's just a Cormac. And my maternal side, John. Uh, I don't know if you know Beth. Beth Cormac. She's just really, really reserved. Really, you know. But if you get to know her, she's really sweet. Um, so there's that. But seeing her in Barcelona was an eye opener because everybody acts like she does. <laughs> so she's really quiet right now. But get her on her own. What do you think? What's shocking about us? Similar to your description. The rest of Spain is much more. Yeah, like Penelope Cruz when she's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the South, the South are very, very, very gregarious. say that's true of you. Super strong personality. Um, these are, these, I mean, I've, been, I've lived in a lot of places, Africa, Pakistan, uh, Congo, Pakistan, uh, China, and, and many years in Mexico. And that there, to, this goes back to your initial question too, the human nature is the same everywhere. It's just like really these, this thin veneer of, of cultural ways that differ from place to place. But the human condition, you know, we all live in the chaos of the sun and the moon. So there are certain conditions that make us all the same. Uh, and a love poem is a love poem. Uh, what, you know, in, 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 in any language. So, what is, um, the other part of the question was, what do you find, uh, I think that was Amanda's question, Amanda asked, what do you find surprising about American culture? Because our target is the English here in the, in the translation. And that's something that you find in English it's, it's, that doesn't feel very Catalan. The one way we ensured fidelity um, was by sort of imitating Saint Jerome. He, he was, a, yeah, uh, Saint Jerome was a fourth-century Christian who, who was responsible for the first Bible in the Vulgate Latin, and he practiced back translating. And back translating, in our case, we did a variation. So once I had my English version and I was okay with it, then I would, because my Spanish is stronger, I would, I would read what I wrote in English in Spanish back to her while she's tracking on the Catalan to make sure that we had exactly the right meaning. Right? And then I would tweak it so that it would, wouldn't sound stilted, it would sound fairly natural. We, we have St. Jerome to thank for, thank for that. Even though Martin Luther, you know, disagreed strongly <laughs> with St. Jerome's version as some of his translations, um, really got a hand to the guy. He was pretty bright to cipher through all those different versions of Luke and all the different versions of Mark and, and then decide. And basically he was deciding on, on what was most accessible Oftentimes, what you know, the stories that were more narrative, which is probably the reason why he kicked Thomas out, because Thomas was a real mystic. You can get him now. You can read the Gospel of Thomas, 
and he says some really weird stuff. You know, and then, the, uh, you know, speaking of Martin Luther, and he could get really weird too. I'm looking to, to read his table talks. You know, he, he would sit around and, like my grandfather, after Sunday dinner, you know, and, and loosen his belt. And Martin Luther had to you know, unbutton several buttons. And then he'd give these long, extended, um, spontaneous talks. Um, and he went, went pretty far out on a limb. Uh, interesting stuff. But just the act of trans, see, see again, just the act of translating um, from the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic into German was a political act that caused war. Spain went to war with, you know, for the Roman church, Spain went to war over that. And with the war, the war, multiple wars of the Reformation. Um, so, so that's what we need to be on guard for. Uh, I think what you said earlier, before, before we were just chatting earlier, Amanda said, uh, why, why can't we just let each other, other be who we are? You know, what, it's okay if I, I often, we use Spanish uh, quite often. And she, and she's now speaking a little to, each week, I my little Catalan lessons, because my, I, I can read it, but I can't really reproduce it. It's too, it's too close to French. I get confused between French and Spanish. <laughs> um, it's like the song says, let it be. And I like that sign that uh, the bookstore has about celebrating the diversity. We celebrate our differences. Yeah. So, from my personal experience, the, I, when sometimes you know when I'm just researching things on my own just for fun, you know I'll find a website that's interesting in another language. Now I'm unilingual and I only speak English, but I'll use Google Translate sometimes, and obviously that's not the best tool, but it's it's enough that you can kind of get an idea of of where it's coming from. I'm curious, as a professional translator, do you think that people are too reluctant to engage the professionals? Or do you think that some of the more, uh, more amateur tools that we have at our disposal are good for the types of things that we're using them for? Well, they're, they're awfully handy if you're, if you're going to China. But, um, <laughs> but I want to warn you about those things. Um, all you have to do is really, uh, look at what they've translated. It's like English to them is like, French to us, uh, la vie de France. You know, everything sounds great in French, so yeah. we put it on soap or on a billboard. You know, but they'll they'll do that with mechanical translators. And uh, here, eat good, smelly feet restaurant, <laughs> because whatever it is they're trying to convey is not coming across. And I'm sure uh, this was probably true for when my my cousin John lived in South Korea. Uh, the Koreans would probably mistranslate things quite badly, right? And um, but I no, those are handy devices. Uh, but just know that they can't translate uh, metaphor, yeah. and they can't translate uh, cultural idiom in any way. But we did avoid a lot of poetry that was just simply too local. Yeah. You know, like if we were to write a poem about. At Astra Bookstore in Salina, and and Jason beats the journalist for the newspaper uh, at the table with Joel. Yeah, it would just it wouldn't be translated because and there are a lot of poet there's a lot of poetry like that. So it's so localized. I'm just as guilty as everyone else for asking my phone questions. And when that technology first came out, I was so enamored with Siri. Say, hey Siri, um, what time do you get off work? <laughs> Siri would say, that is not an appropriate question. I said, well, who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? 
<laughs> I got a scientific explanation that Poo Cookie Monster was, you know. There's a poem, uh, there were several, I can't think of a single one, but I know that I was super impressed by a meditational poem about the French symbolists. The French symbolists had enormous influence on these, these poets, uh, poets like, uh, if you know the French who they are, the Valérie Baudelaire, uh, Paul Verlaine had a huge influence, and Marguerite writes a poem where he's meditating about Baudelaire in Café L'Opera, which is on the Ramblas, which evidently we were just, we just passed, uh, was it Melania Obama was on vacation and we, I think she was, and her bodyguards walked right by us and we were at that café in, in the Ramla. Yeah, the Ramla just means it's that part of Barcelona where you can walk uh, because it's closed off to cars. Some towns do, you know, they have these wonderful places you can walk around. And he's, in the poem, he's, he's thinking about Baudelaire and um, the atmosphere of the cafe. He's a really nuanced poet, and it can't always capture him. And that first poem he read, that Paquita read in, in Catalan, there is, he's like Robert Frost. He, you know, most people think they get him, but they don't really get him. Um, there's embedded submerged imagery that's the submerged imagery. Hi, Beth. I'm more family. Um, at the end of the poem, when the, when the, when the, the logs catch on fire and the smoke rising, it's a resurrection image. He's, his, his daughters are li literally resurrected in his mind. And um, one or two readings, you know, get that. But you know, and Frost was like that. He said all the fun in writing was um, making something sound like it formulated, but doesn't quite formulate. And, and a good example of that is that the, the two roads diverged in yellow wood. That, that doesn't formulate. That's not a commencement poem that says, this is grassy, ah, and that's grassy too. Uh, they're equal. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. And that made all the difference. Okay. So he's negating, he's affirming, negating, affirming, negating, and this has made a difference. Hello? Come again? No, it doesn't. It doesn't formulate. He was constantly doing that, playing with ambiguity, which is why we now label him a high modernist poet that was dealing in, in ambiguity, not in, not as my grandmother read him, next to Edgar A. Guest on the, on the coffee table. Uh, I think that I should never see a poem as lovely as a tree. That is a little bit higher <laughs> level going on. You know. Of the poets, <clears throat> of the poets in the book that you have, you said that one of them had died this year. Are the other ones still living? Yes. All of them. All of them, yeah. Marius was the only one we lost. Uh, Marius was born in 1928. He had a rough time near the end and could not, couldn't. Uh, couldn't really get up or down. He had back pain, and um, yeah, we would be celebrating his 90th birthday yesterday. Mm. So when uh, when you spoke with them, what was their take or their perception of saying, "I want to translate your work into English"? Well, once they they usually they've done a little research when they find out we're coming, right? And so. They, they were told, uh, the, the fellow that's coming, number one, they, they know what the NEA is, that the guy is an NEA poet, 
uh, they, they were told that I won the Latitudes Award, which is a best uh, translator. Best, I share that at the uh, Latitudes Award with the best American translator with Robert Bly. And also I had the same, uh, the equivalent of the NEA from Mexico. So uh, I didn't go over there naked. I mean, I went over there with a, with a, a pedigree. So they were pretty receptive. Now, now, there's a flip side to that too, because when you go into a town, and you mention uh, that you know, you're a translator and you're in town, all the cockroaches come out from underneath the rocks. Right? Suddenly, you've got to deal with 150 poets, and you really only want to translate five. You know? So you've got to sift through, and that was her job. <laughs> that was her job. I am not going to read that stuff. <laughs> and so she learned, she had to learn really quickly how to spot a bad one and, and toss them out. And she worked probably harder, as hard or harder than I did. And by all rights, she should be the one who's talking. But uh, she's not, she's comfortable talking one on one with you in English, but in front of an audience, I think she's a little shy. Mm -hmm. I don't want to like look him off show. <laughs> in Barcelona, with the chorus, and by the internet, and everything. Here, it's your job. <laughs> I said, I told her, you know, it's like, dear, it should say, uh, translated by Francisca Esteve and Marlon Fick. She says, no, 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 no. By Marlon Fick and Francisca Esteve. No, dear. Francisca Esteve and Marlon Fick. No. Marlon Fick and Francisca Esteve. And, that she, she, her, her argument for having me build first on that was um, literature's my career, you know, and so I don't know if that's a good reason or not, but this is her first book. So, yay. <laughs> she, she's a painter. She just won the People's Choice Award for the Wagner Noel Art Museum. And um, we're very proud of her. Where is that? The Wagner Noel is one of those um, extremely oil rich, filthy rich uh, families that live in West Texas. Um, they were friends with the Bush family, also from West Texas, and in the Odessa area. And they, so they donated a museum. They gave money for a concert hall. We have some wonderful outlets, even though we are in, you know, the town that I only knew our town for some movies, uh, Friday Night Lights, uh, Blood Simple, an early Ethan Cohen movie, and uh, No Country for Old Men, and all of that's true. <laughs> uh, we were canvassing going to meeting people on both sides of the political aisle, working for, uh, we, well, we'll just tell you, we worked for, we're on staff with uh, Congressman O'Rourke Beto. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked with him from February to November. Uh, we are good friends. If, um, if he does go someday to Washington, I may be the next Secretary of Education. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> because I'm gonna guard those Pell Grants I am not <laughs> going to attack those Pell Grants. Those are the only way that some of our poor students can ever go to college. This, I'll just say it. And I, I, don't keep, I don't take opinions like that with me into my classes, and I don't talk about parties. But I will, tell, I will tell the students there is a very bad person in that job. Betsy DeVos is not your friend if you're a student. He wants to jack up student loans to 20%. And she owns interests in the banks that are doing that, that want to do that. So, uh, my father was uh, called by the same party years ago and asked if he was interested in that same position. Oh, wow. And uh, he got excited and started packing. And I said, Dad, um, your guy has to win first. <laughs> And he didn't. <laughs> I 
actually got a fairly good president, George H. W. So I think we're just going to mingle now. Um, but I also wanted to let you know, Tammy, we really appreciate your introduction. Yes, um, but I, I forgot to tell them where they can pick the book up at. Yeah, would you like to? I would love to. You can pick the book up at the front table and bring it over here and I'll ring you up. And uh, do we need like a Sharpie or something for you guys to I have a pen if anybody okay. wants that. Okay, so if you're interested, like I said... I can sign it and devalue it for you. Uh, <laughs>